welcome to Hearthstone Deck Tech Season 2, Episode 1, Bomb Warrior with Meaty HS. Hey everyone, welcome to a new season of Hearthstone Deck Tech. This is Season 2. Season 1, we spent a lot of time just talking about popular archetypes and... Um, uh, yeah, how to play those decks, uh, and but it was all from my perspective, and I feel that that's kind of disingenuous in trying to become the best player you can be because I'm not one of the best players, clearly, right? So um, while I may have some insight, my perspective is uh, a little smaller than I think some of the better players. So this season, every episode we will have a guest that's either a content creator or a high legend player, um, maybe a grandmaster, but I, I want to put the focus on a lot of players that don't get the kind of exposure that I think they deserve because there are actually quite a bit of um, strong and uh, strong players at Hearthstone. So um, with that in mind, I'd like to introduce my next guest. So for today's guest, for the initial guest for season two here uh, at Hearthstone Deck Tech, I wanted to pick someone who I really admire as a player uh, and that I think is, is extremely good and doesn't get enough credit you know, out there. And this player, he plays for Team Barrage. He's hit rank one legend on um, wild and on standard multiple times. And I think at one point in time, he hit rank one at both la uh, ladders at the same time. Um, and this player is Meaty HS. You've probably heard of him, the young doctor from Cambridge. Um, and yeah, Meaty, welcome to the show. Wow, what an introduction, Ken, thank you. Me, me, are we going to give out your official name? Are, are we going to give your real name here? Like, can we use your real name or should I just keep calling you Meaty? Well, you can call me Meaty, you can call me Tom, you can call me Teapot if you want. I don't really mind. <laughs> why, why, did you go with the, why did you go with the name Meaty anyway? Well, what's the background be, behind well, that name? Well, you know, the, I went with the name Meaty. Actually, it was my dad that um, went with that name. So when I, was, uh, when I was about 10 years old, I used to play... Um, massively multiplayer games like mm -hmm. World of Warcraft and in one of those games uh, well I used to play them with my dad and he uh, he kind of created my character for me and it was a little fat dwarf called Meaty oh. um, so yeah my, my dad kind of chose my name oh, essentially that's, that's Just, great. Uh, stuck, uh, stuck with me that's great that's great you got the support from your father uh, what does he think about um, I don't know I mean does he know you play Hearthstone a lot I, I assume he does yeah, yeah, he's um, he's been to some of the tournaments with me, some of the um, European Championships uh, that I played in this year. Um, my dad's flown out to support me, so um, yeah, I love my dad a lot, and uh, he he's uh, he's as supportive as a parent can be of somebody who spends too much time playing children's card games. Oh my God, you know I that resonates so well with me, my dad. Uh, you know, I, I host tournaments on Guam for like different types of games, like not just Hearthstone, but like like fighting games and stuff, right? And my dad like 100% supports that. He has like a uh, one of our team jerseys and stuff, and I'm just like, man, this guy's crazy. That, does your dad? You of course gave your dad like a Barrage Esports jersey with your name on it, though. <laughs> well, I, I haven't even got a Barrage Esports jersey. Oh on my man! Name, to be honest, those guys are yeah, slapping. I mean. Dude. Um, Nah, I mean, uh, to be fair, um, I think Barrage has done a lot for me as a player. So they've, they've supported me going to events um, and they've uh, sort of helped me to get my name out there a bit. But um, I think being realistic about what um, players and teams bring to each other, I, I think a lot of the time players expect teams to give them more than they deserve um and i think when i think about what i've given to barrage and what barrage has given to me i feel like i i've had a pretty good deal like i don't need jerseys i i haven't sort of won any huge tournaments for them so great yeah. no that's great that's a great outlook that's a great point um hey can you tell us I, I know I gave you that little quick intro about a couple legend finishes, but can you tell us about your history with the game of Hearthstone? Like, how you started get play, uh, how you started playing in it, and 
um, when you reach a point where you were vying for, I guess, competitive types of finishes? Absolutely. So I started playing Hearthstone um, about four or five years ago. Um, at the time, I I'd kind of played other games. I, I played a card game called Dominions for a long time, mm-hmm. which was like more of a kind of um, actual card game, which I which I kind of enjoyed. Um, and I was a fan of board games, but I hadn't kind of been serious about a computer game for a few years um, when I picked Hearthstone up. Um, it's just a friend who asked me if I wanted to start playing it. So. Um, yeah, I, I would say I played pretty casually. I played a lot of Arena when I first started playing Hearthstone, uh, just while I started to build up a collection. I think I first hit Legend after um, after playing for about a year. Um, and after I hit Legend once, I, I kind of didn't make it there again for another six months or so, and then I managed to get there again. and. After after I've been playing for a couple of years, I started to hit legend pretty consistently. Um, and at that time, I started to play the game a bit more. I qualified for a uh, a seasonal championship in uh, 2017 by finishing top hundred on the ladder. Uh, but then after that, I kind of just um, I, I got to legend, but I didn't really get any proper finishes as such. I really decided to. Um, try a bit harder in Hearthstone at the start of uh, 2018, end of 2017, start of 2018. Um, that was when I decided, you know what, I'm pretty good at this game. I've had a few high legend finishes and with the Hearthstone Championship Tour being announced, I was excited because there was a big emphasis on ladder. This was something that I could do. Um, I. Being, being a kind of doctor or a medical student at that time, you know, I, I didn't have very much time to travel to events. I didn't have very much time to um, compete in tournaments. So the, the kind of prospect of um, ladder being where all of the, uh, the points were earned was very exciting for me because it gave me a, a kind of opening to um, become a competitive player and so I, I kind of went for it and um, I think I, I managed to get a top 25 finish which was the maximum amount of points that you could earn from uh, I think from October 2017 all the way through to November 2018 apart from one season I missed a finish um, but uh, that, that was probably my biggest achievement in Hearthstone, just being consistent on the ladder. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to uh, qualify for any, um, any of the world championships or the world qualifiers, but the best I did was I finished ninth place um, in the uh, winter playoffs in 2019. So I, I was very proud of that. So, I'm yeah, sorry, did you, did you say that you got top 25, you held a top 25 position from, for a year? Like, every month you were in the top 25? Yeah, so I, um, I got a top 25 finish um, every month, apart from one, for uh, 15, no, I, I think it's uh, for 14 months in a row. Are you, wow, that's, that's crazy that's wild that that's amazing man that's amazing and and your your proudest accomplishment throughout that run was a like a rank eight or i'm sorry a eight eighth or ninth ninth yeah awesome amazing um you know you mentioned a little bit how uh the previous point system kind of catered towards you know uh, people in your position who can't like you know at the time maybe by because of school university or their job can't travel to these other bigger events to play and the latter becomes uh, a viable option for you. What do you feel about the way Grandmaster is designed now uh, with this season and the 48 players going and the rest kind of on the outside looking in? Well, I think the Grandmaster system is great for the people who are, who are invited, uh, but it sucks for anybody who's not invited. Yeah. Um, if you compare 
uh, the deal that I got last year to the deal that I get this year. Um, last year I could um, sit at home and play games of Hearthstone on the ladder. I could play for half an hour, then I could eat my dinner. I could play for half an hour before I went to work. I, I could just play here and there. Um, and provided that I put in the effort at the end of the month um, and that I played kind of uh, logically and sensibly and consistently throughout the whole month, I would get a top 25 finish and then I would be rewarded by an invitation to the playoffs where um, I wouldn't have my travel paid for me, but I would earn sort of a minimum payout of about $1,000, um, as would everybody else who qualified. Um, so uh, there was a, a very realistic, achievable goal for the everyday working man. Um, and that was great. You compare that to the system we have now, um, the, uh, the, the championships they have are not all kind of held in Europe. Um, one is held in America, one is held in Asia, the next one's held in Europe and they cycle around. So travel expenses are a lot higher. And um, on top of that, not everybody who is invited is guaranteed to take home any money. Wow. Uh, so say that I do qualify, let's say even if, even, if I, even if I were to qualify, would I go to one of these events? I'd have to pretty heavily consider it because I'd, I'd probably have to fly to somewhere in America or Asia. That's going to cost about $500 uh, plus. I'd have to pay for all my accommodation and um, I wouldn't even be guaranteed to get any money from it. So completely different to um, the, uh, the system we had in 2018 already. And on top of that, um, we haven't even got to the, the qualification system yet. Yeah. Um, you have to play in these Open Cups and you have to win an Open Cup to qualify. Now, how difficult is it to win an Open Cup? Um, you, need to, you need to get a win rate of um, about 90% um, in best of threes over over 10 best of threes to qualify, or I think actually it's 11 best of threes. You have to, you have to basically go 10-1 to win an Open Cup. Uh, now, that's, it, it's doable, obviously somebody has to win the Open Cup, uh, but you have to high roll, you have to get lucky. Um, and if you look at the kind of statistics uh, for people who've qualified, almost all of them have been playing, have, have been playing these Open Cups non-stop. Um, they've played like 20, 30. Some people have played almost 100 Open Cups. Wow. Now, that is not doable for anybody with a job. Um, yeah. Whereas if you, if you compare that to Ladder, where you play for sort of half an hour, um, and then you can take a break, you can, uh, you, you can play for another half an hour later in the day. If you enter an Open Cup, you're committing to 12 plus hours of uh, being on call and having to be available to play Hearthstone. Um, that is not in any way achievable for somebody who works, uh, particularly somebody who works a shift pattern. Like I, I, I could maybe sort of um, take time out to do one of these Open Cups, you know, once a week. But am I likely to qualify if I'm only going to do once a week? Probably not. And if I did qualify, would I go to the event? Probably not, because it's not kind of worth the uh, the travel expense, if that makes sense. No, that does. And that, I mean, that's pretty insane when you think about it. Like one of these Open Cups, you know, lasting, you know, 10 to 12 hours, uh, you know, 11 rounds and... You know, I yeah, I think really one of the biggest issues is that you it's such a time commitment, and if you get second, it feels the same as getting last. <laughs> and if you it win, does, absolutely. Like, I mean, even if you win and you do go, like, if you don't get into the prize money, that also feels very similar to getting last in an open cup, except you put a little more time and you traveled right. So, out of your ex own expense. So, I mean, that that is certainly definitely ridiculous um what do you uh what is your favorite archetype of all time well like you've been playing for quite a while oh i'm a i'm a combo deck player so 
I love any deck that can kill the opponent in one turn. I loved uh, Patron Warrior back in oh, the yes. day, yes. even though I wasn't very good at Hearthstone when Patron Warrior was a was a powerful deck. Um, I, I was a kind of rank five player at that point. Um, and then um, Raza Priest as well. That's got a special place in my heart. Um, Quest Mage, when that first came out, loved that deck. Anything with a with a crazy combo, that's my kind of deck. Awesome. I, uh, Patreon Warrior is the first time I ever hit Legend. I hit that. I hit Legend like two days with uh, Patreon Warriors. It was so crazy. Such a wild deck. Wow, nice. And it had such polarizing matchups. Um, like you know, Mage. Like I, I, that's what I liked about the deck. Like, yeah, you you had the OTK combo. But you could also just get that board, and I just couldn't clear that board. Or like versus freeze mage, you're just armoring up every turn. And I, I really thought it was intuitive. It had like a lot of different strategies for its win conditions. Yeah, um, those are always the best kind of decks, in my opinion. The kind of decks where you have lots of different um, possible win conditions, and part of the fun is. As you go along throughout the game, you have to kind of work out, okay, what's my hand doing? What's my opponent doing? And you have to adapt your win condition as you go along. But those are the fun decks to play. The most recent one we had, I think, was probably Togwaggle Druid or Malagos Druid. Yeah, those Togwaggle is super fun to me. I, I didn't really care too much for Malagos Druid, but, oh, man, Togwaggle is just a, a fun deck. Uh, Sipiwi and I, we played that. Or, well, he Sipiwi coached me for, like, three hours just playing that deck. It was a lot of fun. It was quite quite a good time. Yeah, he was. Yeah, Sipiri was a uh, was very very talented at that deck. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, you mentioned a little bit about being uh, versatile and open to new lines of play. Um, what are some basic principles you think that separate um, high legend finishers like yourself from you know either people who don't hit legend or maybe people who are at the other end of the spectrum in legend? That's a very good question. So I, I think um, if, if your question, if I'm understanding it right, is how do I get, how do I finish um, in the high legend at the end of the season? Is that right? Yeah. 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 I mean, well, I, or like, do you think that there are core principles of the game that maybe players at a lower rank? Uh, miss or forget yeah, about? So, um, yeah, I think um, I, I would say that by the end of my um, HCT year in 2018, I had certainly developed a formula for achieving a ladder finish. There were certain strategies, so um, at the very basic level, um, you have to, um, in order to get a high legend finish, you have to, number one, have a high win rate, and number two, you have to play a lot of games. Um, so how many games do you have to play? I think it, it depends how high you want to finish. If you want to finish in the top 100, in the top 25, um, you're probably looking at playing sort of 500 to 1,000 games in a month. Wow. Um, and what kind of win rate do you have to achieve? Um, I would say anywhere between sort of 56 and 60% can get you there. Obviously, if you're getting a 60% win rate, then it's going to take you less games. Um, and in, in terms of the best win rate possible you can achieve, uh, I would say the best win rate achievable on the ladder is probably somewhere between 60 and 65 percent now the next question is how do you increase that win rate well the easiest way to increase the win rate is um outside of the game of hearthstone take a look at um statistics on websites like hs replay use those to optimize your decks and your mulligans um and also use them to point you towards decks that might be better than the archetype that you're currently playing. Um, if you're good at using the data on websites like HS Replay, you can increase your win rate very rapidly by um, probably sort of 2 to 3%. Um, and before I started using statistics 
um, to optimize my decks and mulligans. I, I was a kind of person who would reach legend, but I wasn't able to get that high legend finish. And as soon as I started to really use and understand that data, that was really the key to um, helping me to get that little bit of extra percent. Um, and I started to get those consistent finishes after I did that. Um, in terms of um, within the game of Hearthstone itself, um, that's kind of more difficult. I would say the best approach um, is to focus on three things um, if you want to improve your gameplay of Hearthstone. Number one um, is just to, um, uh, is to work hard. So um, play a lot of games, practice a lot, um, and after each game, uh, the, the second thing to do is reflect. So just ask yourself, what went well? What didn't go so well? How would I improve on that next time? Maybe even write some notes down um, so that you have, uh, after a match, you, you sort of write down or you mentally know a single sentence about something you've learned from that match, which you could apply if you're in a similar match next time. And the third thing that you can really do is to have fun. I think that uh, if you're not having fun, then uh, you're not going to be engaged with your debt. You're not going to improve with it. Um, and I think if, if you do all of those things, so if you have fun, if you work hard, and if you reflect on your performance, uh, that's, a, that's a good recipe for success. Great, man. That's great advice for those at home. And uh, those at home, you know, Meaty touched on uh, using stats and parsing data from sites like HS Replay. In, I know in season one we talked a, a bunch about uh, using the different types of statistics available to uh, to garner that type of information. But uh, you know, if you want to hear it from the horse's mouth, make sure you go to Gamer Sensei and you know at, get coaching from Meaty and learn directly from him. It's definitely worth it. Um, you know, Meaty, uh, I know that you you are now. A certified doctor um, uh, you know there's just been changed there's a change to the ranking system in Hearthstone in terms of qualifying for events um, what are your goals in the game now I mean I, I know you play this leisurely and recreationally but uh, uh, how competitive competitive are you going to continue to be in the game and what, what are you looking to do with your life outside of the game it's a good question um, well I mean, in terms of competitive, competitive Hearthstone, I don't think there's much there for me at the moment. Um, I've already touched on uh, what I think of the new system. Um, I don't think it's cut out for um, players like me who have other jobs and families to look after. Um, so at, at the moment, uh, I, I'm taking a break from competitive Hearthstone. Um, that doesn't mean that I don't play the game a lot. Like I, I'm still enjoying playing the game on ladder. Um, I, I actually enjoy competing on the ladder. I, I feel like when I play on ladder, I'm playing competitively there because I'm always looking to uh, get to the high ranks because that's what I find challenging and fun. In terms of what the future holds, I'm not sure. If uh, if they change the system, then I may reconsider entering competitive Hearthstone again. But if uh, as long as the Grandmaster system continues, I think uh, I think I'm uh, I'm just taking a back seat. Awesome. Um, so you know, I, I saw on the Twitter, and we were talking about what kind of decks you were going to talk about today, uh, and you brought. Bomb Warrior, and for the for the those of you listening to the podcast, the list has two Eternium Rovers, two Shield Slams, one Town Crier, two Warpaths, one Weapon Project, two Acolyte of Pains, two Augmented Elix, two Clockwork, uh, I don't whatever the the Goblin, two Shield Blocks, uh, two Militia Commanders, two Omega Devastators, two Wrench Callers, a Brawl, two Dynamatics, Harrison Jones, Ziliax, Azelina Soul Thief. Uh, Blastmaster Boom and Dr. Boom Mad Genius the hero uh, the, the Death Knight um, this is a pretty crazy list Meaty why, why did you choose to, to show us this deck today uh, so this is, this is the deck that I've been playing on the ladder um, 
at the start of May um, over the last couple of days. I think the list is very good. Um, I'm always a fan of powerful decks. I like to win, so I like to play the best decks. And I think really there's three decks that stand out for me as being good in Hearthstone at the moment. I think, um, I think um, Pirate Rogue is really good. I think any kind of warrior is really good. And I think Bomb Hunter is really good. I think those are the three decks to beat. Um, and if you want to play a deck, you have to check it against all of those three. Now, I would argue that Bomb Hunter is probably the best out of all those three because I would kind of challenge you to find a deck that is good against Bomb Hunter. It's, pr it's actually pretty hard. It seems to be um, pretty well matched against everything. But I mean, the deck that I'm going to talk to you about today is Bomb Warrior. Now, if you if you just pass Bomb Hunter out of the picture, um, Bomb Warrior is pretty good. Um, and in fact, any kind of warrior, Control Warrior, Bomb Warrior, uh, Mechathune Warrior, you're going to beat Rogue, which is a lot of what's on the ladder. That's that's appealing for people who like to win. Uh, yeah. Is a deck that beats Rogue, um, and naturally because Warrior beats Rogue, there's also a lot of Warrior on ladder. So the question is, okay, my Warrior is going to beat Rogue. How do I tech my Warrior to beat other Warriors? Now, when I first um, started playing after Rise of Shadows expansion. I didn't like Bomb Warrior very much. I thought, what are all these bomb cards? They're rubbish. I'm going to take them out of my deck and I'm just going to play a control deck. Um, and this does much better than, uh, than Bomb Warrior because it's beating Bomb Warriors. And I think for a long, a long time, um, Control Warrior was considered to be favored against Bomb Warrior. However, uh, there's a card which I've experimented with in this deck, which is uh, Azalina Soul Fiend, the seven mana free free, which replaces your hand with a copy of your opponent's. Yeah. Um, I think this card single handedly flips the warrior mirror on its head. Because um, if, you, if, you, if you don't run Azalina, uh, what inevitably happens is uh, the warrior armors up out of range of your um, uh, your kind of bomb damage and your burst damage and then and, and then after you've run out of stuff they just kind of play their Elysiana and they just win in fatigue and that's how the matchup works if you have Azalina you play all of your bombs you make sure that you get the maximum juice out of all of them. So you play your Elec, followed by your Clockwork Goblin, and then your Wrench Calibre when you have 10 mana, and you pump four bombs into your opponent's deck. Nice 20 damage. And you've got two, and you you can do that twice. So 40 damage worth of bombs. That's a lot of damage. Not enough to kill a warrior, but it's a lot. And the Blastmaster Boom is a very powerful card as well. Uh, those boom bots are probably going to connect a face for another 10 or 15 damage. So after you've done your 50 damage or so from your bomb package, what you then do is you apply pressure to your opponent. You keep applying pressure, pressure, pressure to him. Enough pressure so that he can't play his Elysiana. He has to keep reacting to the pressure that you're playing. And then after you can't apply pressure anymore, you have no more way of applying enough pressure to prevent your opponent from playing Elysiana. You play Azalina Soul Fiend. And then all of a sudden, you're, you've got the same hand as your opponent. Nine times out of ten, they're going to have drawn their Elysiana by that point in the game. And quite a lot of the time, they draw their Bouncer as well. So all of a sudden, you're in a position where you've dealt 50 damage to your opponent and you've got the same hand as your opponent, and you're not losing in fatigue anymore. So I think this, this card, this one card, Azalina, kind of flips the warrior mirror on its head, and I think it makes the bomb warrior 
Um, it, it ticks that magic box of making the Bomb Warrior favoured against other Warriors, uh, which for a single card is is a very, very powerful thing indeed. So, um, and of course, you're, you're kind of beating Rogue anyway with that deck. Yeah. So, uh, versus, bo or versus Warrior, are you kind of hiding the fact in the early turns, like turns one through seven of the game, that you are running a bomb package and like just playing control warrior-ish and then on 10 you play the Alec into yeah. that stuff or yeah absolutely so um yeah in the in the mirror there's very few there, there's almost no reason to play your bomb cards before turn 10 number one it helps because your opponent assumes you're playing control warrior number two um, if you play uh, the weapon, for example, it's almost always going to get destroyed. Most people run two copies of Weapons Project and one copy of Harrison Jones in their deck. So um, in a mirror match, your weapon is almost certainly going to get destroyed as soon as you play it. So no point playing that early. And also, um, yeah, you, uh, you aren't going to be able to get the maximum use out of your LX. Uh, and it's not like you're you're kind of struggling for time in the warrior match. You know, this match yeah. is going to go on for 20 or 30 turns. So you've got more than enough time to wait patiently to get the maximum use out of your bomb cards. Okay. How about, so you said the rogue matchup is uh, relatively simple. Um, what kind of stuff am I looking for in the mulligan versus rogue? And how should I approach that matchup? Am I, you know, trying to be the aggressor there or just try to kill their um, miscreants, keep their board clear? That's a good question. So, how do we approach a rogue matchup? Or should be... Um, I, I guess, let's think about the game plan first. So the game plan is just survive. Um, you just need to remove the rogue's threat as they come out. Um, and there, there does sometimes come a point where you may need to switch to be the aggressor, but for the majority of the game, you are the control deck. So how do you, uh, how do you control? Well, um, there's a few critical points. The, f the first point is turn one. Um, and obviously you've got three one drops in the deck, you're gonna keep those. Uh, they're great to play on turn one. Um, the, the next kind of key point is turn three. So Rogue starts to do stuff on turn three. The, the most aggressive play they can make is to play a big Van Cleef. Um, so that often happens if they're on the coin. If, uh, if I'm going first in the Rogue matchup, I normally keep a shield slam because that's the only way that I can really answer Edwin Van Cleef. The other cards that I keep, because they can help to activate my Shield Slam, are um, uh, I, I keep Shield Block, the um, gain five armor, draw a card for free mana. Um, the other card that I keep for free mana is Acolyte of Pain. I think Acolyte of Pain is very good against Rogue. Rogue has lots of ways to deal two damage, has lots of ways to deal four damage. Acolyte of Pain sits in an awkward spot uh, where the rogue has to kind of overextend or let you draw two cards. And if you play it on turn three against rogue, it normally draws a card out of their hand and lets you draw two cards, which is really, really good. Um, so we've got one drops, Acolyte of Pain, and Shield Block. And the other card that I keep in this matchup is Dr. Boom Mad Genius, because uh, provided that you can survive the early turns, this card is just bonkers. Um, um, it's also the, the weapon destruction effects are pretty good against Rogue as well. Often they have a big swing turnaround yeah. at turn four, and use, using a weapons product or a Harrison is pretty good. So I, I will often keep weapon destruction. Um, and that's pretty much it. That's my mulligan against Rogue. So going back to the the, the warrior matchup though, uh, would you do you keep Azalina in that matchup? Or actually, I guess it doesn't matter, right? Because you're playing the long game, you're going to draw into that stuff anyway. Exactly. Um, and this the version of the deck that we're talking about today has a lot of cycle in it. Two acolytes of pain. It has um, it has a Harrison Jones. So you you're going to cycle a lot with that deck. Um, you're going to most often cycle as fast as or faster than your opponent so you don't need to keep 
as Alina. Just remember that your opponent's going to play their Elysiana towards the end of the game. So um, you only want to play your Azelina when they have drawn most of their cards so that you can um, gain a copy of their Elysiana and uh, essentially steal their win condition. Um, you know, so I Azelina uh, is in there for that warrior matchup, uh, but is she the 30th card? What other cards in the list that, or this list that we're looking at now, do you think are flexible and what are some popular tech options? Should people be facing more rogue or, uh, you know, more of something else besides warriors? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I think one of the LX is flexible. I think the LX is probably one of the weakest cards against Rogue. That's really there um, for the Warrior Mirror matchup. So if you're facing a lot of aggressive decks, you can consider taking the LX out um, and just having one LX. Um, Weapons Project is kind of flexible as well. I think Weapons Project is great because uh, of the inherent synergy it has with Harrison Jones. Um, but I'm only running one and not two in this deck because um, I feel like Weapons Project is uh, is kind of a dead card in the mirror matchup. You only really need one of them. Um, and two bits of Weapon Destruction is absolutely fine against Rogue. I think it's sufficient. But if you are facing a lot of Rogue, you could, you could put in another Weapons Project. It's very good against Rogue. Yeah. If you're facing a lot of Warrior, you can take a Weapons Project out. It, it doesn't do much in that matchup. Interesting. Um, what are there any like uh, maybe weird does it, like is there a play that people learning the deck probably always make with this deck because they think it's the right play, but it's really like maybe the wrong mistake when piloting this deck. Is there like something that's not very counterintuitive? I guess that's a really good question. So. Yeah, um, I, I think there is, I, I mis I've done a few hours of coaching with this deck and I think the mistake that most people make is uh, playing their bomb cards too early in the wrong matchups. So let me give an example. Um, against, against Rogue and against aggressive decks, you don't really care about the bombs in the deck. You care about the minion being on the board. So for example, let's say that I've got a Clockwork Gnome on turn three, um, against Rogue and I've got no other turn free play. I want to play that clockwork no. I want it out on the board so that it can trade into whatever minion my opponent's gonna play. Let's say we're against Warrior. I don't want to play that clockwork no. The free free body is not gonna do much on the board. My opponent is gonna remove that very easily. Um, it's very important in the Warrior matchup to save all of your bomb cards and use them synergistically together when you have 10 mana. Okay. That's the main mistake I see people make the deck. I guess the other mistake I see people play, uh, make is uh, using Azalina at the time. Um, the key to using Azalina effectively is you, you, need, you need to kind of match three different conditions for Azalina to be effective. The first condition is you need to um, have a bigger board than your opponent. If your opponent has a bigger board than you when you play Azalina, it's gonna be hard for you to get back onto that board because you're using the same resources as them, but you're kind of starting a losing race, if that makes sense. Yep. Yep. So number one, you need to have board. Number two, when you play Azalina, um, you need to, uh, have a kind of higher life total than your opponent. That one's not quite so necessary, but it helps a lot. Um, and number three, preferably your opponent needs to have more resources in their hand than you. Otherwise, why are we even playing Azalina? Yeah. So essentially, um, when you pick that Azalina up in your hand, you need to be thinking about those three conditions um, and you need to be watching very closely for when all of those three conditions are met. And you need to be actively trying to meet those three conditions. Um, and once you meet them, that's the time to play the Azalina. Yeah, and I, I, I'm guessing like the, well, because we're talking primarily about the Control Warrior matchup here, right? So um, typically the turns before you Azalina, you're dumping a lot of this stuff in your hand, right? Like the Elec with the gnomes or the goblins and into the weapon and 
you know, I mean, you're you're yeah. pretty, you're playing you're playing pretty loose, right? You're trying to free up the hand space, right? So. Oh yeah, absolutely. So you're, every, every single turn, like one start playing bombs, um, you need to be aware. Okay, my opponent um, with every passing turn is going to be getting scared of those bombs. Um, they're going to be wanting to play their Elysiana as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, so. Or, or maybe not as soon as possible, but they're going to want to play very easy on a more turn. And you need to you need to be careful because if they do play that Elysiana, you're in trouble. All of your bombs go and um, you don't have a kind of gateway to win the fatigue matchup anymore. So um, you need to just keep asking yourself, can I put enough pressure on my opponent to stop them playing Elysiana? If the answer is yes, great, do it, use your cards. If the answer is no, you need to heavily consider whether it's time to play Azelina in that situation. Because if your opponent, if you give your opponent too much freedom and they play their, their Elysiana, you're, you're in big trouble. Great, man. You know, I'm, I'm excited to, to go and onto ladder and mess with this deck a bit. I'm sure I'm going to have more questions. Um, you know, Tom, thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. Is there any final words that you want to, I don't know, maybe share with uh, anyone listening? Um, maybe social media that they can hit you up with uh, for any kind of information or coaching or anything like that? Yeah, well, I mean, anyone listening, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to the podcast. I appreciate your support. Um, if you want to follow, my, you can find me on Twitter, MeetyHS. Um, I normally post deck lists that I use to hit top 10 legend with, so, um, and, and I retweet other people's deck lists to get to number one legends. So, um, if you want a kind of source of high quality decks, then it's a good place to, a good place to come. Um, I also do coaching, details are on my Twitter, MeetyHS, um, and, yeah. Well, thanks. Um, yeah. Well, Tom, thank you so much for being on the show once again. Um, those of you at home, we have a great season of, of different guests like Tom um, who, who will be on in the coming weeks. So stay tuned for that. And we will see you in the next episode of Hearthstone Deck Tech. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ken.